My name's Jessica, and up until a few months ago, my life was pretty much on the ideal track you'd expect for a 25-year-old. i just wrapped up my degree and snagged a manager position at a bustling trading company. Things were looking up, and then, at a party thrown by some mutual friends, I met Jake. Jake was a guy you'd notice right off the bat, tall, with a loud laugh and a way of filling the room that made you feel like you were the only two people in it. He came over to where I was sitting, holding a beer in one hand and a plate of half-eaten snacks in the other. Hey, you're Jessica, right? I'm Jake. Heard you're the brain running the new show downtown, he said, sliding into the seat next to me. Yeah, that's me. I smiled, trying to match his easy demeanor. And let me guess, you're the life of every party and possibly every after party? You got me. He laughed, clapping his hands in mock surrender. Guilty as charged. So, what brings you here, apart from obviously elevating our collective style quotient? We clicked instantly. Jake was easy to talk to, and despite his casual front, he seemed genuinely interested in what I had to say. We spent the rest of the evening chatting about everything from our jobs to our favorite TV shows, and by the time the party wound down, we'd exchanged numbers and promised to catch up soon. In the weeks that followed, Jake and I saw a lot of each other. Our dates ranged from simple coffee meetups to adventurous evenings out in the city. He was fun, but also had a rough edge that made our conversation spark. We often debated fiercely over films or politics, him always pushing back with a grin whenever I got too bossy with my opinions. Come on, Jess, you can't seriously think that's the best movie of the year? He'd challenge, throwing his hands up in disbelief. Watch me convince you, or are you scared you'll actually agree with me? I'd retort, bumping his shoulder lightly with mine. Life felt good. Real good. But as they say, when things seem too perfect, life has a way of throwing a curveball. I just didn't expect mine to come so fast and hit so hard. It was a clear Saturday morning, the kind where the sun decides to show up in full glory and not a single cloud dares to hide it. I was out for a drive with my folks, planning to grab lunch at that new seafood place mom had been raving about all week. Dad was at the wheel, mom was navigating, and I was in the back seat, mindlessly scrolling through my phone. Jessica, put that thing down and look outside, would you? It's a beautiful day. Mom chided from the front seat, her tone playful, yet firm. I laughed, slipping the phone into my purse. All right, all right. You win, Mom. Eyes on the scenery now. Dad chimed in, his voice always steady and reassuring. Good. You kids today with your gadgets. When I was your age, I was always looking out the window, counting cows on the road trips. We all laughed, and I leaned forward between their seats, feeling like a kid again on one of our family road trips. The conversation shifted to casual updates on relatives and dad's recent fishing trip with his buddies. So, caught anything bigger than a minnow this time, Dad? I teased, poking fun at his often exaggerated fish tails. A minnow? You'll eat your words next time I bring home a catch. Just wait, he retorted, grinning in the rearview mirror. Mom rolled her eyes, smiling. Let's see if we can get through lunch without your father, declaring himself the fishing champion of the state. The light-hearted banter was cut short by a sudden blare of a horn. Time slowed down as I looked up. A truck had veered into our lane, speeding straight toward us. Dad's hands tightened on the wheel, his knuckles white as he tried to swerve. Hold on, he shouted, the last words I heard before the crash drowned out everything else. The impact was deafening, a brutal cacophony of shattering glass and crunching metal. My body jerked forward, then slammed back, pain shooting through every nerve. Darkness edged my vision the sounds around me fading to a distant, muffled echo. When I came to, the world was a haze of sirens and people shouting. I tried to move, to get to my parents, but nothing responded. Panic clawed up my throat, my breaths coming in short, sharp gasps. Ma'am, can you hear me? A paramedic peered into the wreckage, his voice a lifeline in the chaos. We're going to get you out of here, just stay calm. Mom, Dad. My voice was weak, barely a whisper amid the noise. Are they? 
The paramedic didn't answer, his eyes briefly flicking away, before meeting mine again. I didn't need words to understand the truth. Tears blurred my vision as the realization hit me like a physical blow. They worked quickly to extract me from the mangled car. Every movement sent fresh waves of pain radiating through my body, but the physical agony couldn't touch the deep, tearing ache in my heart. At the hospital, doctors buzzed around me, their faces grim as they assessed my injuries. The news wasn't good, my spine was damaged, and my legs, they might never carry my weight again. The loneliness was crushing, only interrupted by the occasional visit from a nurse or doctor. That's why when Jake walked in with his parents, it felt like a burst of normal in my sea of chaos. Hey, Jess, Jake said softly, pulling up a chair next to my bed. His parents stood just behind him, awkward smiles plastered on their faces. Hi, Jake. I managed, my voice raspy from disuse. It's good to see some familiar faces. We've been worried about you, he said, reaching out to take my hand. It felt warm, solid. How are you holding up? Been better, I said, trying to keep the mood light, despite the ache in my chest. But I guess it could be worse. Linda, Jake's mom, stepped forward, a tight smile on her face. We just want you to know we're here for you, Jessica. Whatever you need. Yeah, thanks, I said, not sure what else to add. It's not every day you lose everything and then have your boyfriend's parents acting like they were part of the family already. Mark, his dad, was a large, imposing man who normally commanded every room he walked into. But there, in the hospital, he seemed shrunken, unsure of himself. We've been thinking, Jessica, he began. And well, Jake has something he wants to ask you. I frowned, confused. Okay. Jake squeezed my hand, his eyes searching mine. Jessica, these last few days, knowing you were here, hurt and alone, it's made me realize something. What's that? I asked, heart hammering. This wasn't a normal conversation. Something big was coming. I don't want to spend another day not knowing you're in my life for good, he said, and suddenly, there was a small box in his hand. He opened it to reveal a simple, but beautiful, engagement ring. I stared at it, then at him, my mind racing. Jake, this is, are you serious? Dead serious, he said with a nod. Marry me, Jessica. Let me take care of you. His parents watched us, barely breathing. Linda had her hands clasped together, eyes wet with tears. Mark just nodded slightly, as if confirming something to himself. It felt like a lifeline, thrown in the middle of my storm. But it also felt rushed, desperate even. Yet, looking into Jake's hopeful face, how could I say anything but, yes. Our wedding was nothing like I had imagined as a little girl. It was a modest ceremony, held in the small garden at my parents' house. I sat in my wheelchair, dressed in a simple white gown that had been altered to fit comfortably around my new reality. The guest list had shrunk to a handful of close friends and family, a stark contrast to the grand event my mother and I had playfully sketched out years ago. My parents' house, now just mine, had been modified after the accident. Ramps and rails were the new normal in my once familiar home. But so was the constant reminder of my limitations. The first few weeks were a blur of adjustments. Jake moved in and, at first, things seemed okay. He was around a lot, helping me move about, cooking meals, and generally making sure I was comfortable. I appreciated it, I did, but there was an undercurrent of tension, like waiting for the other shoe to drop. One afternoon, I was trying to reach a bowl from the upper cabinet, a feat that had become a Herculean task from my new, lower vantage point. Need some help there, babe? Jake asked, walking into the kitchen. Just a bit. I replied, frustrated at having to ask yet again. He grabbed the bowl and handed it to me. You know, I read online about some tools that might help you with this stuff. Like grabbers or something. Yeah, maybe. I muttered, not wanting to think about stocking my home with yet more reminders of my disability. Things started to shift then. Slowly, Jake began spending more time away from home. 
His helpfulness waned, replaced by absences that he brushed off with vague explanations. Where were you last night? I asked him one evening when he came home later than usual, the smell of alcohol clinging to his clothes. Out, was all he said as he flopped down on the couch, not even bothering to remove his shoes. Just needed to blow off some steam. I maneuvered my wheelchair closer, feeling a mix of anger and concern. Jake, you know I can't just go out and blow off steam. I need you here. He sighed, a sound that seemed to carry more annoyance than apology. Jess, I can't be cooped up here all the time. It's tough for me, too, you know. The days turned into weeks, and the neglect became more apparent. Meals he used to cook turned into takeout boxes he couldn't be bothered to throw away. The bathroom that needed to be accessible became cluttered with his things, making it harder for me to maneuver. One morning, I caught him in a particularly foul mood as I asked him to move his stuff off the bathroom floor. Can you just deal with it for once? He snapped, his patience obviously worn thin. I didn't sign up to be a caretaker. Three months after our wedding, Jake quit his job, dropping the news as casually as if he were talking about the weather. I don't need to work anymore. He said one morning, coffee in hand, a smug look on his face. You've got enough money from your folks. We're set. I stared at him, my stomach churning. So, what, you're just going to live off my inheritance, that's your plan? Why not, he shrugged. It's ours now, isn't it? His words chilled me. It wasn't just the house or the money he felt entitled to, it was my entire existence. I was supposed to be his wife, not his meal ticket. Things around the house started to change, and not for the better. It was the little things at first, paintings that had hung on the walls for as long as I could remember were suddenly gone, and heirloom dishes that were supposed to be passed down to me vanished from the cupboards. At first, I thought I was going crazy. How could I misplace these things when I could barely get around? One afternoon, the house was unusually quiet. Jake and his folks were out, supposedly at some all-day event. I was alone, which was rare these days. I was in the living room, trying to reach a book from a lower shelf when Maria, my masseuse and only real friend these days, came in for her weekly visit. Hey, Jessica, how you holding up today? Maria asked as she set her bag down. Not great. I sighed, abandoning my attempt at the book. Stuff's going missing, and I don't know if I'm just forgetting things or what. Maria frowned, helping me back into my chair. What kind of stuff? Important stuff, like my mom's paintings and some antique dishes. I can't prove it, but I think someone's taking them. That's messed up, she said, her brows knitting together in concern. Do you want to do something about it? Like what? It's not like I can set up cameras all over the place, I muttered, feeling defeated. Well, actually, I might know a guy who could set up some mics. Just to see if you can catch whoever's doing it talking about it? Maria suggested, her tone careful. I hesitated. It felt a bit extreme, but then again, I needed to know. Okay, yeah. Let's do it. A few days later, Maria came by with a guy who discreetly placed microphones in several rooms. It was all very spy-like, and I half expected it to be a bust. But what we eventually heard chilled me to the bone. It was late one evening, a few weeks after the mics were installed, and I was listening through the recordings. Jake's voice came through first, clear as day. We should be able to get a good price for those dishes, he said, sounding nonchalant. Yeah, the paintings fetched a pretty penny too, his mother, Linda, responded. There was a clinking sound, like she was sorting through silverware. I felt sick. They were stealing from me, selling off my family's things right under my nose. What about Jessica? She's bound to notice more things missing. Jake's dad, Mark, chimed in. That wheelchair keeps her pretty tied down. And once we move her to a home, we'll have all the time in the world to sell off the rest, Jake said, a hardness in his voice I'd never heard before. I paused the recording, tears stinging my eyes. Not only were they stealing from me, but they were planning to get rid of me, to shove me in some home and wipe their hands clean of me.
I replayed the recording when Maria came over next. She listened, her face set in anger. We need to do something, she said firmly. You can't let them get away with this. I nodded, wiping away tears. I know. I just, I don't know what to do. First, we save every recording. Then, we go to the police. And you call your lawyer. Maria plotted out, her tone brooking no argument. Okay. I agreed, feeling a flicker of hope amidst the betrayal. Let's take these bastards down. The next morning, I woke up to find the ramps that allowed me access to different parts of the house mysteriously dismantled. I stared in disbelief from the doorway of my bedroom, my usual path to freedom abruptly cut off. Jake. I called out, hoping for an explanation, but dreading the answer. When he finally appeared, his face was a mask of faint concern. Oh, hey babe, Jake said casually, as if nothing was amiss. We had to take down those ramps. They were getting old and, you know, safety hazard and all that. Safety hazard? Jake, I need those to get around. How am I supposed to move through the house now? My voice cracked with a mixture of anger and desperation. Don't worry about it, Jess. We'll figure something out, he replied, his tone dismissive, as if it were a minor inconvenience rather than a major blockade to my independence. But I am worried, Jake. You can't just decide these things without talking to me first. I live here too, remember? I snapped, my frustration boiling over. Jake shrugged, the gesture like a slap in the face. Look, I'm just trying to look out for you. You could have hurt yourself with those old ramps. His words twisted in my gut. Looking out for me? More like trapping me. I spent the rest of the day confined to one part of the house, my mind racing with the implications of what they'd done. The walls felt like they were closing in, each room a reminder of my growing helplessness. The next few days were a blur of helplessness and brewing fury. I was stuck, literally and figuratively. Jake and his parents came and went as they pleased, their voices low and conspiratorial, leaving me out of their hushed conversations. One evening, Linda came by to check on me, her fake smile firmly in place. Jessica, darling, how are you holding up? We're just so worried about you being on your own, she cooed, her voice dripping with false sympathy. I'm managing, I replied coldly, not in the mood to play nice. Seems like I'll have to get used to it, with the ramps gone and all. Oh, that was just a precaution, dear, Linda said, patting my hand in a patronizing manner. We're just trying to keep you safe. You know how much we care about you. Her words stung, the lie so blatant it was almost laughable. Safe? They were stripping away my mobility, my freedom, piece by piece. That night, after Linda had left with a breezy goodbye, I called Maria. They're boxing me in, Maria. I can't even get around my own house now. I said, the edge in my voice sharp with anger and a trace of fear. We need to act fast, Jessica. Maria responded, her voice tight with urgency. This is more serious than we thought. It's not just about stealing from you now, it's about control. After we hung up, I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling. The feeling of being trapped was suffocating, but the fire of defiance was building within me. I just needed a chance, any chance, to turn the tables on them. And I was determined to find it. The next morning was a whirlwind. First, I called the service that deals with the disabled to report how Jake and his parents had dismantled the ramps, my main way of moving freely around my own home. They were quick to react, promising to send someone to assess the situation immediately. Next, I called my lawyer, Mr. Thompson, and explained everything. He was furious on my behalf and wasted no time. I'll be there this afternoon with a couple of officers and a representative from the disability service. We'll sort this out, he assured me over the phone. By mid-afternoon, my living room felt more crowded than it had in a long time. Mr. Thompson, two police officers, and a representative from the Disability Rights Service were all present, along with Jake and his parents. The atmosphere was tense, the air thick with anticipation and dread. 
Jake and his dad looked shocked, like deer caught in headlights, when Mr. Thompson started speaking. We are here to conduct a thorough check of the premises, he announced. I have here an inventory of all items listed in Jessica's parents' will, and we will be verifying that these items are accounted for. Jake tried to protest. This is ridiculous. Jessica, why are you doing this? Before I could answer, the representative from the disability service intervened, his tone stern. First, we need to address the removal of accessibility features in this home. It's been brought to our attention that necessary ramps have been dismantled, significantly reducing Ms. Thompson's mobility and independence. The color drained from Jake's face as the representative walked through the house, noting where each ramp had been removed. Meanwhile, Mr. Thompson began checking off items from the inventory list. It didn't take long for discrepancies to appear. Several high-value items were missing, just as I had suspected. Linda started crying, her sobs loud and dramatic. Please, Jessica, we didn't mean any harm. We were just trying to make things easier. Easier for who, exactly? I shot back, my patience wearing thin. Mr. Thompson continued his inventory check, his expression growing grimmer with each missing item. This is serious, he muttered, jotting down notes. Mark, who had been silent, finally spoke, his voice shaky. Look, maybe we got carried away, but we can sort this out. Let's talk about this, Jessica. There's nothing to talk about, I said, my voice steady, despite the chaos around me. You've been stealing from me and planning to ship me off. There's no excusing that. As the reality of their situation set in, Jake and his parents became increasingly panicked. Mr. Thompson finished his inspection and nodded to the officers. Based on the evidence and the discrepancies here, I think we have enough to move forward. I looked at Jake, his parents, and then at the officers. I want to press charges, I said, my voice firm. And I have recordings of their conversations discussing their plans to sell my inheritance. The officers listened to the recordings, their expressions stern. After a few moments, one of them turned to Jake and his parents. You are under arrest for theft and conspiracy, he announced, and began reading them their rights. Jake looked at me, betrayal written all over his face, not understanding that the real betrayal was his own. As they were led away, his mother's cries echoing down the hallway, I felt a mix of relief and sorrow. It was over, at least this chapter of it. The court case was a grueling process, but every day I showed up, determined to see it through. Sitting in the courtroom, watching Jake and his parents face the consequences of their actions, brought a mix of emotions. I was angry, but also relieved, that the truth was finally out. During one of the breaks, Jake tried to approach me. Jessica, I, I'm sorry. I never wanted things to go this far. He said, his voice low. I looked at him, the man I thought I knew, the man I thought loved me. Sorry doesn't change what you did, Jake. You made your choices. Jake and his parents were found guilty on multiple counts of theft and fraud. The judge was stern as he delivered the sentence. Let this serve as a reminder that manipulation and greed have no place in our society, he declared. With the legal battles behind me, I focused on rehabilitation. The doctors were amazed at my progress. You're a fighter, Jessica. You've come further than we initially thought possible, one doctor said during a session. Rehab wasn't just about physical recovery, it was about rebuilding my life. I started going out more, meeting new people, and even took up a new hobby, painting. It was therapeutic, a way to express everything I had been through. One day, at a community art class, I met Alex. He was funny and kind, and he had this way of looking at life that made me believe in the good again. We clicked immediately, and soon, we were spending a lot of time together. Jessica, you know, this might sound crazy, but I feel like meeting you was meant to be. Alex said one evening as we walked through the park, my wheelchair rolling smoothly beside him. I smiled, feeling genuinely happy for the first time in a long while. I think I can believe that. It's nice to have someone who just gets it, you know? Yeah, I do. 
he said, reaching over to squeeze my hand gently. One morning, I visited the grave of my parents. I told them about everything that had happened, about the trial, my recovery, and Alex. I miss you both so much, but I'm getting back on my feet, literally and figuratively. I said, laying flowers on their tombstone. Walking away from the cemetery, I felt their love with me, like a gentle push forward. I was moving on, but I was taking them with me in my heart.